Father in heaven, as we <laughs> come this morning, we thank you for this privilege once again. Thank you for your presence and thank you for these thy people. As we prepare to look into your word, please give us understanding and give us insight. Give us strength, Lord, to walk more upright before you. Forgive us, we ask, of all of our sins. Cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Open thou now my lips, and my mouth will show forth thy praise. It's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> Let each of us say amen. Certainly, we thank the Lord for each and every one of you. Thank the Lord for these babies, and thank the Lord for the young adults. Almost said the bigger babies. <laughs> we thank the Lord for each of them. I want to again go to a passage of scripture we're all familiar with. It really wasn't all that long ago that we were in this passage. I don't know the full reason, but for some reason we're drawn back to it. Psalms 51. <clears throat> Psalms 51. And I just want to begin reading a few of these verses, Psalms 51. This is a psalm written by David. This is David's repentant prayer before God after he had an affair with Bathsheba, contrary to God's will. David says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I have acknowledged my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward part, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with high soap, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide, that, hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Even though there's more verses, I want to stop right there. And I want you to think about this title how much does that cost? <clears throat> How much does that cost? Everybody in here, except maybe for the children, and they have too, which is it. When they went, they were taken by an adult to a store where somebody went looking for clothes, shoes, handbags, suits, or whatever else they could find in the department store. And what most people do is when they find themselves in the store, they walk over to the rack and they start slinging clothes around on the rack, investigating the items that's on it. 
But then when they run across something they like, they snatch it off the rack. Why do you say snatch it off the rack, Pastor? Because I've seen some of y'all shop. <laughs> snatch it off the rack, twirl it around and look at it, hold it up to themselves, and say, I like this. I'm really going to look good in this. Can't wait for somebody to see me in this. They like it. They found it. They like the way it's made. And they can't wait to wear it. But there's one other thing they do before the, before the ordeal is finished. On all of those clothes is a tag that tells you how much it costs. And I don't care how much you like it, I don't care how much you want it, you don't leave that store without looking at how much that item costs. <clears throat> In other words, what I'm driving at, and this particular young people, I need you to pay attention to this, there are some costs associated with decisions that we make in life. Somebody said that if you have to ask how much something costs, then you can't afford it. Well, to a certain degree, that's true. But let me give you the flip side of that. Because oftentimes, because we don't ask how much the cost is, we end up paying more than we expected. You listening to me? <clears throat> I'm not just talking about in money. We'll get to the other part here in just a little bit. Many pay no attention to the high cost of the decisions that we have to make each and every day. Young people, I want you to particularly understand this morning, and this may be why we brought back to this passage, <clears throat> but I need to hasten to say that it's not just young people that need this. Some of us older folk need to be reminded of it as well. But we need to pay attention and realize that there's a cost to be paid for the decisions that we make. There's a high cost that you pay for running around with bad company. <clears throat> there's a cost that you will pay if you allow your life to go and drift aimlessly through life. There's a cost that you will pay when you constantly, day in and day out, try to paint yourself up with a false image. What do you mean false image, Pastor? Well, I'm glad you asked. False image means you spend all of your waking time, all of your energy and your resources, trying to make yourself look like, walk like, talk like somebody other than who you are. <clears throat> I know this happens. Because I've seen some of his pictures on Facebook. <clears throat> I've seen some pictures of some young Christian women, some that used to belong to this church, some still do. Let me say this, when you make yourself look like a woman on the street because of the way you want to make yourself look on Facebook, there's a price to be paid when you get with the wrong company. There's a price to be paid when you start drawing the wrong attention, attention that you really didn't want, but you're the one who put the price out there. You can't walk around and call yourself calling on the name of Jesus, go to nightclubs with your homegirls, put on the shortest and tightest clothes you can find, drape yourself across somebody's car hood, take pictures of yourself with your big old legs sticking out there so everybody can, I'm going to just tell it like it is. There's a price to be paid 
for things like that. <clears throat> There's a price to be paid for slothfulness. And in case you don't know what slothfulness is, if you've been with us in a study of Proverbs, Solomon uses this word quite a bit in the, in the book of Proverbs. Slothfulness is someone who is lazy. <clears throat> someone who wants everything handed to them on a platter. They're too lazy to work. They don't want to work. Can't even spell the word work. <laughs> Slothful, lazy, wasting their time. All they want to do is turn over in the bed and sleep on the other side and turn over on the other side. And it reminds me of a story once of a young man who needed a job. And he got down on his knees and said, Lord, I need a job. Will you please open the door for me to have a job? But the problem is, is after he got on his knees, he crawled right back in bed. <clears throat> I got news for you. The job's not going to come knocking at your front door. And you got to go to where it is. When we spend our time kicking the opportunities that God gives us on a daily basis to walk closer to him and to be more of a testimony and a witness for him, when we kick God's word to the curb and treat it like it's nothing, there is a price to be paid. Adults, I want us also to understand that there's a high cost that we are paying. Notice I didn't say gonna pay. There's a high cost that we are already paying because some of us have failed to be the parents God has called us to be. Godly parents, raising our children in the fear of him. But no, we let them do what they want, go where they want, stay out as long as they want, come in and tell us what to do. When we walk into their room, they don't want us in there because that's their privacy, that's their room, and that's their junk. Well, I got news for you. Who put that junk in there? Who's paying the rent? Who's paying even for the clothes that's on your back? But parents have failed, and as a result of that, we're paying a high cost with what we see with some of our young people right now. And we can't put it all on the young people. Sure, there's some whose minds are wayward, and sure, there's some whose minds are twisted. But it all goes back to being properly trained. It all goes back to being taught in the right way. We can't let values slip and expect everything to turn out all right. I realize, and I think I've said this just a few days, a few weeks ago, our mayor and many others are scratching their head, trying to figure out what to do about the crime problem, trying to figure out what to do about the shootings and, and all the crazy things that's going on. But the problem is, when it comes right down to it, Sister Ford, I discovered that not too many people want to pay the cost for what it's going to take in order to get things in order. The cost that's going to have to be paid is parents are going to have to be parents. The cost that's going to have to be paid is children are going to have to learn who the parent is. The cost that's going to have to be paid is young people have to learn to respect authority at home, and when they respect it at home, they'll they, they, they respect it in the schoolhouse, they'll respect it in the church house, they'll respect it in the street. If when it starts at home, somewhere the price has got to be paid if we want to get them back where they're supposed to be and pay the cost and stand up and be what God has called each of us to be. But as long as we allow our adversary to make us think the mountain is too high, the valley is too wide, the ocean is too deep, and I can't do anything about it, the worst things are going to get because we refuse to pay the cost that God has called us to. We as adults have lost our commitment, and as a result of losing our commitment, we are paying the cost. Ignoring who we are in Jesus, I'm talking to us as believers now, ignoring who we are in Jesus will cause a great cost to be paid. Today's passage will teach us and shows us a few things about this king named David. I don't think there's anybody in here who hasn't heard of King David. The choir this morning just sang a song about David, I think, in Goliath. Everybody knows about David. Everybody knows that David, according to Scripture, was a man after God's own heart, had the favor of God, had the love of God, elevated to be king in Israel, the second king following King Saul. David had a friendship and a relationship with God. But one of the things that we can learn about David and his dilemma and his situation 
that I don't care who you are, I don't care how high you think you sit, I don't care how many people know your name, I don't care how much power that you wield, don't ever think that you can't fall. Paul says, I believe as he writes to the book, the, the church in Galatian, let not a man think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Because as soon as you start thinking that you're all of that in a bag of corn chips, the stage is set for you to fall. Satan is just looking and licking his chops, wanting to make some of us fall just as far as we can. And if our minds are not king, if our spirit is not in tune with God, if we are too weak and find ourselves being tempted and willing to yield on every side, we'll find ourselves making the same mistake that David meant, made when he looked over the wall and saw Bathsheba bathing in the night. The moon had everything bright. He could see her naked bathing. And when he saw her bathing, the humanity took over in him. And and as a result of that, he ended up committing adultery with a woman that was already married, who was in David's army, out on the battlefield. And David set it up so not only could her husband be killed, but, but try to hide his sin. But when David found out that he was having trouble in his kingdom, when David found out that now he was having trouble in his home, when David found out that he was even suffering some difficulty, even in his physical body, which is what Psalms 32 is all about, David recognized when Nathan was sent to him and Nathan the prophet made David aware that he had sinned before God, David now falls down and pins and cries Psalms 51. Aretha, even though the song she sang years ago had nothing to do with what we're talking about, she had a song that says, you better think. Y'all remember that? I know you do. You remember the Four Tops? They had a song too called Still Waters Run Deep. While the song has nothing to do with what we're talking about, the idea is you better look before you leap. But in that hymn book, on the back of the pews in front of you, you'll find that there's a hymn in there that says, Just think of his goodness to you. If we will pause sometime and think about the goodness that God has shown toward us, it ought to help move us out of the way of temptation. It ought to help move us from making wrong decisions as we reflect upon how good he has been to us. It ought to motivate us to want to serve him even more. David lusted after, after uh, uh, Uriah's wife and he tried to cover it up. And then when Bathsheba came up pregnant, David sure enough got busy calling himself trying to hide some things. But I've got news for you this morning, church. I don't care how far we run. I don't care how long you get down the path. We cannot get away from God. You can run, but you can't hide. Listen to me, young people. You might think nobody sees you. You might think nobody's listening to you. You might think that nobody knows what you're doing. Mama may not know, and daddy might not know, and even the officers of the church and others may not know, but there is one who sits high and looks low, who knows every thought you have, knows every word you speak, knows everything that you do. And even when you turn the lights out and the room is so dark that you can't see your hand before your face, God can see you clear as day. And if you have named his name, if you have named the name of Jesus and have a relationship with the Father through the Son and the Holy Spirit is dwelling on the inside of you and you decide to yield to temptation, let me tell you what you're doing. It ain't two of you rolling, rolling around in that bed. You're making three roll around in that bed. You, your friend, and the Holy Ghost. Because if you've been born again, the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you. And anything we do in our body that's sinful, we make him party to it. <sighs> Getting awful quiet in here, Greg. <laughs> I 
I want you to know this morning, God loves us so much that he has made a provision that in spite of our uncleanness, in spite of our sin, in spite of our transgressions and iniquity, he has made a provision so that you and I can be cleansed. Look with me, look with me if you will, in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, and then I want to jump into the very next chapter, chapter 2, and read verses 1 through 2. In these passages, the Apostle John writes under divine inspiration and lets us know the provision that God has prepared for our cleansing. And it's for every body. I don't care how much dirt you think you have been. I don't care how much, how ugly your life has been. You can't be too dirty that God can't forgive you and clean you up if you're willing to let him. John says, starting in verse 5, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, look at this, cleanses us from all sin. But you know what? There's some people who get beside themselves. Look at verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. But John continues in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 2. Look what he says. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate. That word advocate means we've got somebody before the throne that speaks up on our behalf. And in case you don't know who that is, John tells us, this Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation, he's the substitute, he's the satisfier, he's the appeaser for our sin. He's offered before a holy God what is necessary in, us, in order for us to have peace with God. He is the propitiation for our sins. And look at this, not for our sins only, but for all for, but also for the sins of the whole world. There is nobody that God can't save. There is nobody that God doesn't want to clean up. There isn't anybody that the Holy Spirit does not want to indwell. Peter says it's not, uh, it's not the Father's will that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. And, as, and, and, and I realize that sometimes we get agonized and angry with each other and, and things that goes on. But let me just put something into perspective for you. Do you know that God loves President Trump? Do you know he wants to clean up President Trump? Do you know he loves Trump enough that he wants to save President Trump? Well, I got news for you. He wants to do the same thing with you if you ain't been washed in the blood. There's nobody beyond the reach of the blood if we're willing to let God do it. David's prayer is a prayer of confession. And in this prayer of confession, there are three things I'm going to give you right quick, and then we'll get out of the way. It's the price of sin, the price of confession, and the price of cleansing. The price of sin. Verse 1 and 2. David says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, and according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Because David lusted and sinned after Bathsheba and committed adultery, and not only adultery, but committed murder, David's relationship with God 
is now broken. His fellowship is now broken. The joy that he had of the fellowship of the Spirit is now gone. The, the anticipation that he had is no longer there. He can, David wrote all kind of songs, but, but, the, but the joy of singing, even God's praise, is gone from his lips. Do you want to know how to shut a Christian up real fast? Let them get up with unconfessed sin and try to sing, try to preach, try to do anything, try to testify. Or you might get the words out, but guess what? There's no power behind the words. There's no strength behind the word. There's no testimony behind the words, whether it's proclaimed or whether it's sang. It's just something, in other words, it turns into a performance rather than a praise. And I'm afraid there's far too many people, far too many Christians, and far too many of our churches that are getting up trying to sing, preach, pray, and everything else with unconfessed sin and not having it right with God. D David tried to get away with that, and he discovered that there's a high price that he had to pay because of his sin. He lost his purity of heart, and not only did his heart lose his heart's purity, David's heart even became hardened. Sin will do that to you. It'll make your heart hard. It'll make it to the point where it, pretty soon you can't hear the voice of the Holy Spirit like you used to. And the more we rebel, the less we're able to discern his voice in our life. And the next thing you know, we're like a ship without a rudder, which is all over the place. Whatever feels good, we do it. Whatever is most popular, we do it. Whatever suits our fancy, that's what we'll follow. But then Solomon says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. David's heart not, David not only lost his purity of heart, which is why he said, Lord, cleanse me. Create unto me a clean heart. David lost his purity of heart, but David's heart was beginning to become hard. But if you notice in verse 2, David uses, uh, well, actually verse 1 and 2, David uses three words. He uses the word transgression, iniquity, and sin. Well, to tell you the truth, all of these can be summed up under one word, which is sin, but they do have their distinctiveness. Transgression means acts of rebellion. In other words, I'm rebelling against something that I know I've been warned about. Have you ever seen a no trespass sign? When a person puts up that no trespass sign, why do they put that sign up? Do you think that person just found that sign laying around in their house and said, well, I think I'll decorate my fence with it. No, they put that sign up because they didn't want anybody crossing that line. They didn't want anybody intruding. They didn't want any interference. They didn't want anybody moving in in their personal area. But what happens when somebody ignores the no trespass sign and violates what the sign says? Then the door is open for them to have some trouble. Sure enough, when David uses the word transgressions, He's saying that God has put a line, drawn a line in the sand, so to speak, and said, don't cross this line. But deliberate rebellion says, yes, Lord, I know you said don't go there, but you're loving, you're forgiving, you're merciful, you won't do too much. I'm going to cross it and have me some fun anyhow. And the problem is, is we think there's no price to pay for crossing the lie. Y'all listen to me? Touch your neighbor and say, wake up. But then David uses another word. He uses the word iniquity. Iniquity means crookedness on the inside. In other words, that which others cannot see. They can see you smiling in their face, but they can't see into your heart the harm that you want to do them. You listen to me? That's what iniquity is. Iniquity is crookedness and perverse, perverseness on the inside. It's kind of like something that 
a, a, a nice little illustration. My daughter sent me one time. I don't know where she got it on Facebook or where she got it at. But somebody had put up this little saying, this little uh, illustration, and I might not get it exactly right, but it was talking about what happens if somebody bumps into you and you got a cup of coffee in your hand. I think if I remember right, somebody said, well, the cup of coffee gets spilled on you. But that really wasn't the right answer. It wasn't the cup that spilled. It was the contents in the cup that spilled. You with me so far? Well, sometimes, under the right circumstances, iniquity will cause what's really in us to spill out when we get bumped the wrong way. Are oh, you listening to me, church? Iniquity will cause some words to come out of us that ain't got no business coming out of us. But because somebody bumped us, it shook it up and it came spilling out. Iniquity will cause us to twist our necks and tell somebody a few things. How I hang our religion as old folks used to say on a nail. Tell them what we think and then reach back and try to pick it up again. Iniquity will cause things to spill out of us that others cannot see that's on the inside. Do you understand what I'm saying? But sin simply means this, missing the mark. God has a standard. God has a standard of holiness. God has a standard of righteousness. And because all of us have sinned and come short of his holiness, we miss the mark each and every day. That's why we make wrong decisions is because of sin. That's why our homes are in shambles is because of sin. That's why the devil has got our young people and driving them straight to hell is because of sin. That's why churches are falling apart with no power is because of sin. That's why some are afraid to preach the truth and can't because of sin. David's heart had become defiled and it had become hard. David couldn't see anything except his sin. And have you ever noticed how the people who's got a guilty conscience is always trying to defend themselves? Hey Amen. I ain't thinking of nobody. I'm just saying what I'm saying. People that got a guilty conscience are always trying to defend themselves. Sin affected David's ears, even to the point where he couldn't even hear, see, hear find something good to hear about the joy of the Lord anymore. And when we run around with unconfessed sin, church, and as a result of that, it blocks our fellowship with God. I don't care how much you come to church, and I don't care how hard the choir sings, and I don't care how hard a preacher is, you just have a hard time finding some joy and something positive that's going on. You look around and you think something wrong with everybody else. No, something wrong with you. David's lips were even so affected that he could no longer be a true witness for God himself. But you know what? I'm glad, that, well, even though David praised this, I'm glad this is not something God does. Because David says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Well, I got some good news for us. If the Holy Spirit is dwelling on the inside of us, he ain't going nowhere. He's going to be there all the time. But we can grieve him with unconfessed sin. We can grieve him by refusing to repent. We can grieve him by walking in our own stubborn way. God will not take away the Holy Spirit, but the fellowship of the Holy Spirit can be broken when we refuse to confess our sin. We need to remember, church, that sin comes at a high cost. And let me give you this one other tidbit before we move on to the second one. We'll move a little bit faster. The price of sin never goes on sale. Macy's might have a sale. Jesse Penny's might have a sale. The price of sin never goes on sale. 
Point number two, the price of confession. We see that in verse three. And don't worry, I'm not going through each one of these verses all the way to what we read. We just, you, you've seen the full story. I just want to point out some things to you. Verse number three, David says, For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Hang on to your hats, church. Here's something we need to all understand. True confession involves more than just saying things with our lips. Are you listening to me? True confession involves more than just saying things with our lips. True confession involves sincere repentance. In other words, we've got to turn from the very thing we are asking God to forgive us for. We've got to turn from it where so many believers get crossed up and find themselves so weak and they think, well, all I got to do is tell God, yell God I lied and yell God I did this and just go on about their business and just keep on lying. There's a whole group of people out there that think that all they got to do is go to church once a week, tell the priest what they did, the priest will forgive their sin, and then they'll leave the priest and go back and do that stuff all over again. That's not biblical confession. Biblical confession means that when I acknowledge my sin before God, I'm turning from that which I am confessing to him. Psalms 51 is about David's desire to turn. Psalm 51 is about David being motivated and wanting to turn. But David recognizes that real repentance, even in real repentance, he needs God's help. He can't turn all by himself. Real repentance calls for a sincere change of mind. If you still got your mind made up that you're going to do this and so, you, you're wasting your time on your knees. <laughs> Boy, I think I shocked somebody. If you have your mind made up that you aren't willing to turn from that which you call yourself spewing out to God, you are wasting your time on your knees. Because he will not hear until the heart and mind is such where we're willing to turn from the very thing we are talking about. You listen to me? Confession means this. It means that I literally agree with God. With what he says about my sin. I literally agree with God. If I agree with God about my sin, and I'm sincere in my mind at turning from that sin, then the forgiveness comes, then the cleansing comes, then the washing comes, then the fellowship is renewed. But there are many believers that have been on the battlefield for a long time who haven't had any real fellowship with God for years. And the reason is, is because they never went back and confessed and turned from that thing that broke the fellowship in the first place. And here's the tragedy of it. You come down through so many years until you don't even remember what it is. But do you want to know how God operates? God is faithful. And that when we are sincere about turning, he'll remind us what we need to do. Oh, yes, he will. I don't need nobody to tell me that. I know that for a fact. He'll remind us of what it is that we need to do. David had to admit his sin. And what we need to be careful of is cheap confession, which is really what I've been talking about. Cheap confession. Don't cost nothing. I'm sorry, God. I shouldn't have went over there. But then, when the Super Bowl party comes up, I'm right back there again.
I hope I ain't raining on somebody's parade. Cheap confession is easy to say with our lips. But the price of it is turn from what it is that we're doing. David wanted to turn. True confession costs something. And it's identified in verse 17. A broken spirit and a contrite heart. David says, Lord, you will not despise. Some of us need to be broken. Some of us need a contrite heart. Because we'll never have the relationship we're supposed to have with God until we are broken in spirit about it. What does broken in spirit mean? Broken in spirit means that I am torn up. That I am agonizing. That I am dissatisfied with my sin. I don't want it there. I want it gone. I'd rather have Jesus. We just sang a song this morning. I love Jesus more than anything. Isn't that the word that was on the screen? Well, broken heart and a contrite spirit means that I don't care what I got to give up. I don't care what I've got to do. If I love Jesus more than anything, I'm willing to do it. That's what brokenness is. That's what true confession is. That's the kind of spirit the Lord is looking for. But sometimes some of us have to be broken. Sometimes, you know, there's some people that you can talk to and counsel with and they'll listen. There are other folk, Brother Drummer, that you had to hit him upside the head with a baseball bat, let him hit rock bottom before they are halfway open up their eyes to see. Why is it that tragedy always has to come before we're willing to learn a lesson? Why is it? You want to know what makes air travel as safe as it is right now? It's because of all the other crashes before it. When we can learn from the mistakes and fix them. Why aren't we learning on this Christian journey? Why aren't we learning in this Christian walk? Why aren't we learning that sin does not pay and there's a consequence for it? Why aren't we learning? Right here in Kansas City, untold number of church-going people died this week. Whether it was from sickness in a hospital, whether it was some, some, some other circumstance, they died this week. And within 60 seconds, after they took their last breath, they discovered they didn't have it together like they thought they did. Eternity is nothing to play with, y'all. When we are broken, and the Bible gives us a couple of examples. You remember Peter? When he denied Jesus three times, the Bible says that Peter was broken, that he wept bitterly because his heart was broken, because he remembered what the Lord said. Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. Peter thought he was strong until the circumstances presented itself. And then he ended up yielding to the circumstance and doing exactly what the Lord told him he was going to do. But behind that, Peter was broken in spirit, and the Bible says he wept over it. That's why in John 21, after the resurrection, Jesus calls Peter to his side and asks Peter, Peter, do you love me? Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. He asked Peter that three times because Peter denied him three times. But Peter got forgiveness because of his broken spirit. Remember Judas? Judas had a broken spirit. But the problem with Judas is, it's why he wanted to turn things around. He ran to the wrong place. He ran to the Sanhedrin council. He ran to the high priest. He ran to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Instead of running to Jesus, he ran to the wrong place. And there are people today running to the wrong place. Oh, Taylor can't help you. JB can't help you. That blunt, that joint, that needle can't help you. You can't get help from somebody who's more messed up than you. We run to the foot of the cross. 
the price of confession can never be altered. Finally, and I said I was going to make this short and a lot again, so now I'm about to go repent. <laughs> the price of cleansing from sin, we see it in verse 7 through 9. Look at it right quick. David says, Purge me with high soap and, wash, and, and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness with thy, which the bones with thou hast broken me rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out my transgression. Church, the price of cleansing is too high for us to pay. The price, the price of being cleansed from our sins is too high for you and me to pay. I've got a pair of jeans at home, Brother Deacons, and in one corner around the belt of that pair of jeans is a little bitty short pocket that you can put maybe a couple of quarters in. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. But that's about all you can put in is about maybe one or two quarters. But then right below that is a bigger pocket where you can put more money or more stuff in it. But do you know that there's some people that for some strange reason think they've got enough in their pocket to take care of cleaning them up from sin? But let me tell you, when you reach in to that top pocket, you discover it ain't got enough. When you reach into that lower pocket where you got more, you will discover you ain't got enough. That loose change that can be considered good works, coming to church, singing in the choir, being the officers, sitting behind the pulpit, change is not enough to cleanse you from sin. Sin put a hole in your pocket so that what you could have had has been long gone. I got news for you. There was a roll call one day that God was looking for somebody, the Father was looking for somebody to take care of the price of sin. And David was called, or, or, or Abraham was called. And Abraham looked at the price. He said, I can't pay because I lied. Looked at Noah. Noah said, I can't pay because I got drunk. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah, I can't pay because I cussed too much. But then there was one who said, I'll pay the price. And I don't care what it costs. Father, prepare me a body. And I'll come down through 42 generations. And I'll pay the price for man's sin. And down he came through 42 generations. Went to a hill called Calvary. Stretched him wide and hung him high. Paid for your sins. Paid for mine. Paid it in full. And I got news for you. I need to put a pin right there. Because when God pays the price, he don't pay part of the price. It's paid in full. It's wiped out. It's done. It's complete. And I got news for you. The price of cleansing costs a lot. The price of cleansing costs Jesus his life. The cost of cleansing costs Jesus to shed his precious blood. The cost of cleansing calls the angels in heaven to see something they'd never seen before. And that is the second person of the Trinity moved from behind the altar, take on the form of man, and became like man. Never seen anything like that before. But there's a question I want to ask you, and I close this now. How much is the decision that you're going to make going to cost? You ain't, gotta, you ain't gotta tell me what it is. God already knows. Some of you are sitting here this morning, ready to make some decisions. But before you do, you better consider the cost. You better think about what it is. It might be satisfactory for a moment. May be joyful for a moment, may be pleasurable for a moment, but are you ready for the price that's coming further down the line? Are you paying a price right now that you didn't have to pay because you failed to check the tag before you took the goods?
How much does it cost? It costs David a lot. It costs David practically everything. His family, his kingdom, and for a period of time, even his relationship to God. But aren't you glad that we serve a merciful God? And just like he forgave David, that's what Psalms 32 is about. That's David singing God's praises because God forgave him of what he's asking for here in Psalms 51. He's singing God's praises. And what God has done for David, he'll do for you and me. The doors of the church are open. How much does it cost? <coughs> There might be one here this morning that does not know Jesus in a part of their sin. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He said, If any man will open up, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. The day that you hear my voice, harden not your heart. The Bible says that if you're willing to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and confess with your mouth that God has raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. If you don't know him, the price of sin is on your head. Judgment, divine judgment, already rests upon your head. But all you've got to do is come to the Lord Jesus. By faith, take him at his word. And that penalty can be removed because the price he paid will appease and satisfy the Father. Your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The Holy Spirit will come to live on the inside of you. No longer will you be considered a sinner before him but now you be considered a child of God. Candidate for baptism, Christian experience, or by letter, we invite you this morning to come. Is there one? He's not only able, but he's willing. Says he's willing. Why don't you become, by faith, become willing? I didn't I didn't expect to hear a lot of amens with this sermon but I didn't expect it to be this quiet either <laughs> let me remind you of something church as we get ready to go even when we find ourselves convicted and challenged by the Spirit of God, the things that may be happening in our lives that we need to get corrected before Him, don't let the devil trick you. 
Don't let the devil make you think that you're no good, that God doesn't love you. Do you want to know the proof of how much he loves you? It's because he brought you here so you can hear it and do something about it. Now, if he didn't care, he just left you where you were. And you could run all around and do whatever it is you wanted to. But he brought you here so you could hear. So don't let the devil trick you into thinking God didn't care. If he didn't care, he wouldn't have brought you here. <clears throat> Amen.